Welcome along to Trip Notes. It's a New Zealand Herald travel podcast brought to you by House of Travel, Better Together. And I'm Stephanie Holmes. I'm the travel editor for the Herald. It's so great to be back. We've uh, had a little summer break, which has been nice. But we're here and we're ready with uh, more inspiration and more destinations of the week. And um, all ready to go to inspire you for your travels in 2020 terrifying it's 2020 but um (laughs) (laughs) this week i'm joined by travel journalist juliet sivitson who's helping me how are you juliet i'm fantastic how's your summer been so far oh it's hard to get my head around the being 2020 it's going to take a little while to get used to but yeah i know it feels like we've time traveled as well as um just come into a new year pretty much yeah yeah. (laughs) um and this week we're also joined by a wonderful special guest so uh she's an apra silver scroll winner multiple New Zealand Music Awards and new album, Chickaboom, is out now. Tammy Nielsen, thank Hello. you so much for joining us. <laughs> How are for you? for having me. I'm great. Thank you. It's so good to have you here. Um, so throughout the episode, we're going to be talking about homesickness a bit later, mm. how to deal with it. You've probably got some experience of that. You've oh, yes. traveled so much <laughs> in your life. Um, and our destination of the week is somewhere close to your heart. Oh. Um, and it's a place... Fun fact, the highest concentration of music industry employees of any city in the world. Mm, Sounds relaxing, eh? (laughs) (laughs) But we'll get to that later. But first, we want to find out about you and your travels and on all the places you've been. So, um, and you're just back from uh, Canada. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was the the final tour of, of 2019. And now I've been doing festivals just around New Zealand for the summer. I like to take the summers off to be home with my kids. Yeah. And I kind of always try to work my tours around school holidays. So I get the best of both worlds, not having to work while they're off of school. And we just get to spend a lot of time together. Of course, by the end of school holidays, it's it's I'm looking forward to the next tour, <laughs> as most parents would yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. They must love coming with you on those times. Oh though. yeah, they do, and it's really special. It's a different it's a different dynamic. It's a lot of work to bring. I mean, as you can imagine, bringing your kids to work um, in any profession is is challenging, but. I love, you know, being able to look out into the audience and see my kids there or see them side stage or um, just having them, you know, when you finish a show and you go back to the hotel room, you're not by yourself, you know, which it, it, traveling and, and touring uh, is, is can be a very isolating lifestyle um, mm. when you're doing it as a musician professionally. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you grew up in Canada, didn't you? So I did. What, what part were you growing up in? I, I was born and raised in Toronto, oh, okay. um, where there's like five feet of snow and it's 25 below. So I'm <laughs> quite happy to be a Kiwi now. Yeah. <laughs> no shoveling snow in the mornings no, of winter. That was the rudest thing, you know, because I, I landed, I literally landed in, I was doing a tour of Quebec and landed in Montreal and they had a huge early dump. It was early November and... Um, you don't normally get snow kind of till, oh, you know, maybe late November is early or December. Um, but you, we turned on the news and it was literally the earliest snow removal in history. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. I landed and went, please turn the plane around. Can I go back home now? <laughs> back to a New Zealand summer. Oh, you just forget, you know, yeah. after I've been here for 15 years and you forget about the fact that if you want to go anywhere, you need to kind of clock in, you know, half an hour before to clear off your car, shovel it out, you know, get the, the, the ice scraper out off for all of your windshield. And yeah, it's just a, it, it's, it, everything's a bit harder. Yeah. See, as a New yeah. Zealander though, I find that sounds so magical. I know. <laughs> My New Zealand well, musicians what we don't are know, fighting right? over who got to shovel. <laughs> that would be such a thrill. I'd love to shovel snow. Seriously. Probably, probably only for like a Maybe week. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like five minutes. <laughs> it gets, yeah. yeah, it gets old pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah, the novelty wears off. But yeah, at first, yeah, my musicians from New Zealand were fighting over who got to shovel the driveway before we had to leave any to go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so when when you were growing up in Canada, obviously Canada is so massive. It's so mm. vast. Did you did you travel around Canada much as a kid? Like did you get to see much of it or were you kind of Toronto based most of the time? No, I only lived in Toronto until I guess I was about 8 or 9 years old and I grew up in a musical family. So it was my mom and my dad and my brothers and I and we toured all over North America, so Canada and the United States for the better part of a decade mm. in a 40 foot motorhome so oh, wow. what a way to grow up and, and see <laughs> see the world so um that I've I guess I've been traveling traveling is my default mode you know it's it's strange for me to be in one place for a long time yeah 
Yeah. What was it like in a motorhome with your entire family? <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, Cozy. which which side do you want to hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Give us the truth. Is my mom going to listen to this? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was an amazing way to grow up. You know, we were all very close and uh, literally <laughs> in proximity. It was like be friends or kill each other. Um, and there were definitely moments of where you wanted to do both. Mm. But I can remember, you know, dad would pull up to, you know, a mall and be like, okay, we'll see you in two hours. <laughs> like let's all go separate directions <laughs> and meet back here at this time you know and, and did he just go and sit in the pub for a while probably <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah cry in his beer <laughs> but um yeah so it it was uh it was a unique way to grow up you don't really realize that i guess until you're an adult the way that you grow up is normal yeah. to you and it's not till you kind of look around and look back and go, oh, that wasn't normal at all. You know, getting to do the shows that we did and, and grow up the way that we did. And and it really built a, a solid foundation, I guess, for me, not only musically, um, having kind of just that life experience, but also um, knowing that it, it wasn't so much... Uh, home is is where the people you love are. So it wasn't as much a place as it was um, the people that you love being with you. Mm. And so I guess that's what, you know, people always say, oh, you were so brave, like moving to the other side of the world to New Zealand. And But I grew up, you know, I think the harder thing was leaving my family. Yeah. But now having, you know, uh, started my own family in New Zealand, I've been here 15 years, um, that you know, wherever they are is home. Mm. And so I, I think that growing up that way kind of gave me that freedom of not really being restricted to one geographical place. Yeah. I guess. You must have seen some amazing places while you were touring or was mm. it always just working? Like, did you get time to explore when you were in the various places you were visiting? Yeah, it's still like that. When you tour, you mostly see the inside of hotel rooms and airports and venues where you mm. play. So, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to get a day off, um, most of it's spent resting. Um, but you try to, between sound checks or loading in, you're trying to kind of sneak out and, and see um, you know, the what what's around you and a lot of it is seen from, you know, a window of a van or a yeah. you know, but you kind of uh grab the moments that you can. When I was younger, we used to be able to because we had our motorhome with us, you kind of avoided all of that. You had your home with you. Mm. And so um we could park somewhere and then explore. So and and we also had more time off in in between whereas now when i tour overseas i think just the fact you know being in new zealand if you want to tour anywhere you get on a plane mm. it's not like you can jump in a motor home and tour you know multiple countries um so yeah it's it's a it's a different experience uh but i still got to see a lot of the world and 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 i get to you know, it's funny, I can I can remember my first time in Paris and it just felt so magic. It felt like I'd had a dream about it because <laughs> I was literally there for not even 24 hours. Right. And it was, I dreamt of being, you know, in that city my whole life. It's one of my bucket list cities. And we literally landed, you know, loaded into the venue, sound checked, and then we had three hours until the show. Wow. And I <laughs> raced around <laughs> Paris and like... But it was it was amazing because it, it does. It felt like this little snatch of a dream, but it you know was something that I get to experience. And yeah. you know, I can remember waking up from dreams as a kid, like, oh, I dreamt I was in Italy. And but I do. I get to kind of have that life of even though I don't get to spend long amounts of time, uh, I think I can still appreciate the little snapshots that I get along the way. Yeah. Does it make you want to go back? Like when you find one of those places? Oh, yeah. <laughs> do, are you able to then at some point plan an actual holiday to those destinations? It's, you know, it's kind of rare that I holiday outside of home <laughs> <laughs> because I travel you know, I'm I'm gone almost almost every month or every other month for a week or two out of every month, um, and so the last thing I want to do is get on another plane mm. and see another airport. Um, uh, but we we have definitely we build our family holidays into some of my tours. So, for instance, um, last year I had a tour that included a couple shows in China, and then we went to Canada for a month, 
And so I said to my husband, now oh, this is the perfect one to, for all of us to go because none of us have ever been to China. Mm. And then we go and my, my kids can, you know, hang out with their cousins for a month and, and with family when I'm kind of zipping out on the weekends doing, doing shows, we had this home base of, so it was kind of the perfect situation to be able to take them. And it was amazing to, you know, we go, you know, a few days early, stay a little bit longer, um, you know, and, and that's how you kind of build things in, stay an extra week here and there and or go a bit early. And that's what we kind of tend to do for for holidays. But yeah, it's it is pretty hard to get a taster of somewhere like Paris or Madrid was like the most, I think, probably my most favorite of all the places I've been. And, you know, to be there for 24 hours, <laughs> it's kind of your dream to go, okay, next time. Yeah. <laughs> you must have a lot of next time. Lots of next time. <laughs> yeah. Lots of next times. Yeah, and I know I think it's a little bit like, I am I am overseas a couple times or a few times a year. And so there are times, you know, when you play certain festivals and you realize I'm gonna be here for kind of five days. So it would be great to bring the family for a week or two before, and then we're here for a few weeks. and. And and you kind of wait for them to invite you back, and then you bring the whole family. So, so yeah, I am I am lucky that way that you know you get a little taster, and then uh, get the whole family and drag them over. Yeah. yeah. Now you you're probably my favorite guest because you've brought some props with you, <laughs> <laughs> which has never happened before. Um, and so you brought some things in that you like that help you be a better traveler. Is that right? Or some yeah. little gadgets that help you? What or what maybe, have you got with you? Yeah. Well, when you travel as much as I do. Um, I mean, I think I did 65 shows in 10 countries last year. Wow. And that was scaling it back. I really scaled back last year and changed the way that I've been touring and traveling. Um, so when you spend as much time traveling in planes, in tour vans, uh, in airports, you know, as I do, you try to find every possible way uh, to make it a little easier. And if you're not, you know, uh, flying first class, <laughs> you know, if you fly for first class, just forget this whole thing. Don't listen. <laughs> just pause it for a while. Uh, lucky you. But if you're a musician <laughs> um, at, at the level I'm at, then finding all these little hacks uh, to make traveling easier. So um, I have, this is probably like my absolute like cannot travel without it okay it's a it's called a turtle pillow but it's t-r-t-l pillow and what it is it's got like this little um almost like malleable brace inside this polar fleece scarf and you wrap it around your neck it's a lovely color it's kind of like a, a salmon kind of pink. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you wrap it around you've got like your cozy little scarf and it holds your head up so That's you don't amazing. have to like have your like the head, head bobbing. Yeah. yeah. So you can either put it on the side or on the front and um, it just holds your neck up and it's so good. And then I always put it over my face yeah. so that keeps all the germs yeah. out on the plane. And not quite as cumbersome. Like I love traveling with a, yeah. a neck pillow, but they're quite annoying when you're having to. And when you don't need them, around. where yeah. do you put it? Yeah. yeah. So this is great. It just okay. kind of. Yeah, if it's anywhere. And then noise canceling headphones yeah, are definitely a must. like absolutely yeah. need these. So it's great for because you're on, I mean, I'm on 36 hour oh. travel, you know, when yeah. I'm going like 18 hours to Qatar and then another seven hours to get to Europe. Um, and you're, you know, watching movies out your ears. Um, these actually, you know, because the little earbuds can start to really hurt. So mm -hmm. these are like these nice cushiony ones. And yeah, bring your own headphones. And then you just flick that little switch there. And it makes it uh, noise canceling, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, I use these at home during school holidays as well. So <laughs> <laughs> Multi-purpose. <laughs> I love my children. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that brings us nicely on to um, another um, thing I want to get your tips for, and that's homesickness, because mm. I imagine you um, would get homesick. You know, you're away from home and your family mm. so often. So do, uh, do you get homesick? Am, am Absolutely. Just, yeah. That is probably the, the biggest challenge I face touring is missing my family, missing my children. You know, and I was lucky, as I said, I was lucky enough to grow up with my whole family on the road. So I didn't have kind of that constant pull, whereas mm -hmm. now it's a very, very different thing. It, it totally changed the way I toured. Um, up until last year, I was kind of following the usual template of 
you go overseas, you hit as many, you do as many shows as you can in one hit. So you're away for like five weeks, five, six weeks. And um, I used to bring my whole band over from New Zealand. And it was just, I was finding it just too hard. It was too hard to, it it wasn't sustainable for me emotionally, financially, Mm. all those things. And so I thought, I looked at the template and went, hold on, like this touring template was kind of created for young single males (laughs) and I'm none of those things. Um, So how would this look like if I changed the way that I travel uh, to suit me as a mom of two that lives at the bottom of the world, Mm. you know? And, um, And so I started using musicians locally on the ground uh, where I would tour to save on bringing an entire band over and maintaining a whole band um, overseas. And also um, I started saying, you know, instead of doing five weeks of shows where there's a couple hundred people a night in clubs, I will fly in, do one festival to 10,000 people and fly home, you know, and I'm gone for a week. And by the time you kind of get there and back. And so I've started doing that this past year. And so far, so good. I mean, every stage in your life, is good. it's going to change. Yeah. And right now, that really works well for our family, rather than the big chunks of time mm-hmm. away. I mean, I'm always jet lagged. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm flying in and out. And I might be gone every other month, but I'm also home every month and yeah. and not away for those really big blocks of time. So that's one way I had to kind of recalibrate the way that I traveled and be more kind of mindful and intentional of getting as much as I can out of the travel that I do. Um, another thing just practically that we do when I'm on the road um, is we used to, when the boys were babies, we, you know, well, they weren't babies. I, they were probably, they were older when I started touring. But um, when they were smaller, uh, we used to, you know, I'd take videos all through the day or we'd FaceTime. And um, now they have this, uh, the only thing was they'd be these huge files that my husband would then have to download (laughs) and then I'd have to try to download mine on my phone overseas. So they now have this amazing app called Marco Polo where you make a video, it stores it in the app and then it notifies them that there's a video and then they can respond and we can even do it in real time. And so anywhere I am, you know, I take videos of inside cathedrals or inside, I'll be at soundcheck and say, oh, look, we're, this is where mommy's singing tonight and, and show them my hotel room. And, and then when the time zones are right, we try to FaceTime every day as well, Mm -hmm. which is usually, you know, their morning and my after gig late night yeah. so you you make it work and you kind of figure out those those time zones but all those things help but at the end of the day you just want to squeeze your babies oh, <laughs> and you just goodness. want them physically there yeah. so that was the reason behind kind of changing the way that I tour yeah what yeah. was the longest period of time that you had away from your kids the longest was five weeks, five weeks. and that was I mean, I know that there's people that do longer than that, but for me, that was uh, really, really hard. And uh, it was it was interesting because it was my first international tour overseas since becoming a mom. And I remember uh, doing my very first show and clearly I was talking about them a lot in the show. And and it was obviously coming across that I was really struggling with it. And a woman came up to me from the audience she was a uh, Canadian this was in Canada and she said uh, you know what I can tell that you're really missing your boys and I just want you to know like I work for uh, she works out on ships um, doing the um, Coast Guard she mm-hmm. works for the Coast Guard and and she said you know my I'm a single mom that's my job and I had to to go but I want you to know we're so close me and my son are really really close and he is proud of me and he saw me work really hard and we spent so much time together when I'm not traveling and he's also closer to my family because of it and so she said I just want you to know it's it's gonna be okay you know so getting those little words of encouragement you know as you travel is is really important too Mm. yeah Yeah. do you ever get I call this reverse homesickness (laughs) 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 where you go somewhere and for whatever reason, you might have a really strong sense of connection to the people there or the place itself. And then you come home and you're happy to be home. But then there's this part of logging for this place that was 
you feel connected to <laughs> in oh. another way. Where have you had that? Norway. Oh, okay. But uh, that's because I have family in Norway. That's my ancestry. Right. And so even though I've got family over there and I've only met them maybe two, three times in my life, mm. I remember the last trip I went there and I spent you know, a week hanging out with family there. And then I came home and I was obviously happy to be back in New Zealand, <laughs> but my heart was panging yeah. for my Norwegian family and just Norway in general. Like I have such a strong connection, connection yeah. to the land there. Yeah. So I call it reverse homesickness. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess I always have had that where I'm always missing someone because I'm from mm. Canada originally and now New Zealand is my home. And, and so there's always that. But I think what you're saying is somewhere that you haven't necessarily lived in or that you're uh, have spent time growing up there. Um, so I think that the place that I feel the most like that is Nashville. Um, I spent... How convenient. I know. <laughs> well, I spent one year living there uh, in our childhood. We we played there uh, for on a year contract. And, um, and whenever I go back there, I just... It feels like home, you know, and... Uh, definitely feels just like putting on an old pair of shoes that are so comfortable. You know, it's it's. Um, I definitely feel homesickness for Nashville. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, that that is very convenient because Nashville <laughs> is our destination of the week. I just made all that up <laughs> just to segue into this. Yes, yeah. Thank you. You can come back anytime. <laughs> so it's nicknamed Music City USA. Mm. There's more than 150 live music venues, um, and it just I've never been there. Have you been no, there? I've no, I've been there either. We're dying to go, and you've obviously spent a lot of time there. So, um, what does it have for a Kiwi traveler? Like, why would music Zealanders go there oh, and enjoy man. it. If you love music, even if it's not uh, particularly country music, um, it's it's the mecca. It is kind of the destination. And it's funny because, you know, there are other musical meccas like New York or L.A., but there's there's nowhere like Nashville because it still feels like a small town accessible vibe. You know, it's there. Everything is so intimate. You go to the venues like the Bluebird Cafe, where you're sitting in a, a room and the musicians, the songwriters, it's celebrating the songwriters more so than an artist. Mm. Um, and you have four of them sitting in a round in the middle of the room, like I could touch them, you know, and they are facing each other and the rest of the room is all watching them. Um, and it feels like a family gathering. And that's pretty much, you know, Nashville in a nutshell is that. You f it feels like family and, and it, it does feel like a really, uh, you know, intimate family gathering. Yeah. So it's yeah. not exclusive. You know, some places you go to and mm. they're amazing, but you still feel like an outsider. Would you say Nashville feels like oh, absolutely. you're just part of it and they welcome foreigners? Yeah. Well, I think that they're, I mean, you've got that Southern hospitality um, and people are very, very friendly and open and, and for I mean, it's a different thing for a musician to go in and you're trying to make it. And of course, you feel like, you know, you're trying to crack into this industry. But as a traveler, as a tourist, as a Kiwi going to Nashville, it's pretty much everything you've ever wanted to experience. You know, if you've ever seen it in TV shows or, or movies, um, you're kind of getting that quintessential music experience. And it's celebrating songwriters. It's celebrating an incredible history um, of country music and we're talking you know right from the pretty much the dawn of the music industry um, it just has it's just so rich mm. with history and um, every every corner has has that history it's it's just um, it's it's a pretty magical place yeah what are some of the must see so you mentioned the bluebird cafe where else yeah. should we make sure we go Oh, well, definitely the Ryman Auditorium. Mm. The Ryman Auditorium, they call it the Mother Church because it was originally a church, um, but was quickly taken over by concerts and everyone from Louis Armstrong to um, God, most recent, everybody plays that room. Uh, the history on that stage, you know, and, and of course, goes without saying the history of country music, the Grand Ole Opry, which is the world's longest running uh, live radio show. Um, was performed on that stage for decades. Um, it then got so big they had to move it. They built a huge Opry house, which is a little bit more on the outskirt of town, 
which holds, I think, 4,000 people, and it's all air-conditioned, which the <laughs> Ryman wasn't, yeah. you know. And, you know, the history is so rich there. They they cut out the circle in the middle of the stage where all the artists would stand at the microphone to sing, and that circle is now at the Opry House. Um, so people still do shows at the Ryman. Um, Have you ever performed there? Oh, that's on my bucket list. Okay. <laughs> I've yet to perform there. I've been to many shows there. Um, but that's on my bucket list is to play the Ryman and to play the Grand Ole Opry, um, which I think is every country music artist's <laughs> dream from the time they're knee high. Um, but it's just such a rich fabric and, you know, and you just want to be a tiny thread in that fabric. I recently binge watched the Ken Burns documentary country music, which just came out a few months ago and just the incredible 16 hours of the history of, of country music and you could barely scrape you know the surface yeah. but um just to be a tiny thread in that fabric is is amazing and 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 it's not just the music the history that you know just the fact that you're on the longest running radio show of all time in the states yeah. you know that in itself is amazing you know aside from it being country music um, so you, you have to go to the Ryman. It's beautiful. It's been restored. It's all the beautiful pews, the stained glass windows, and they do a really great tour um, of the backstage and they do a, a tour of the whole venue. Um, right across the road is the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum, which is this multi-billion dollar building which is so incredible um is that the one that looks a bit like a, like piano, a piano from the yeah. outside yeah so every element of the building is musical um and and ties in with with music and uh it's it's incredible um even, like i said even if you're not a country fan if you're a music fan if yeah. you're a history fan you will love it you know you'll see dolly parton's outfits you'll see hank williams outfits you'll see uh willie nelson's you know, everything and johnny cash everything is in there um you can spend days in there honestly um but and they're always playing live music there's um discussions with artists uh i remember the first time that we walked up there they had on the front lawn uh this huge huge front lawn they had a free concert with uh nashville legends the time jumpers who are fronted by Vince Gill, who's a legendary country artist. And it's just a free concert. You're wandering through the city and there's this massive free concert with the best musicians in Nashville all just playing casually, you know? And yeah. that's, uh, so many magical things happen in Nashville. And the artists and the people are so accessible. I remember when we were touring through there as kids, we were teenagers and we went into the boot shop, the boot corral, you know, to get some <laughs> new cowboy boots and uh, walked in and looking at some boots. And this guy stood next to my brother and he was looking for some boots and it was Garth Brooks. <laughs> and Jay just looked at him, my brother Jay, and went, you're, you're Garth Brooks. Like, <laughs> and he was a massive fan at the time. And and he's just, oh, yes, lovely to meet you. Oh, where's your family? And, you know, chatted with us, took a photo with us. That's Nashville in a nutshell. You know, there's no kind of egos. It's it's very, people are very accessible. And that's not to mention the food. I was going to ask oh, you about my God. <laughs> Bring your stretchy pants. Okay, great. Yeah. Bring the Good stretchy tip. pants. Um, man, it's like pretty much you can go anywhere and there's incredible food. There's incredible music. Um, if you kind of want that experience of really amazing southern home cooking like there's the barbecue peg leg porker which is right downtown on cannery the cannery which is an old uh factory that they've converted into music venues mm. um very very cool spot and right across from it is the peg leg porker and it's pulled pork barbecue and great name oh my god <laughs> it's amazing and sweet tea but get it unsweetened and then add your own sugar um and then if you go a little bit, like half hour, uh, kind of south of Nashville is this iconic place called the Loveless Cafe. It's been there since the 50s. They make the best biscuits and preserves and fried green tomatoes and fried chicken, like everything fried and bad for yeah, you, but it's yeah. so good. <laughs> and um, yeah, stretchy pants are the key <laughs> to any trip to Nashville. And then if you kind of want, uh, I mean, if you're wanting that real honky-tonk Nashville downtown experience, you go to Tootsie's or Robert's, which Tootsie's is the bar that is at the, at the back door of the Ryman Auditorium. 
Patsy Cline, Hank Williams, Willie Nelson, everybody used to go there and drink yeah. there between sets on the Grand Ole Opry. It's got this amazing rich history. It's a giant lilac purple building. You can't miss it. Um, so you go there. It's now just rowdy honky tonks full of tourists. But if that's what you want to do, uh, then that's the place to go there or Roberts. Um, I mean, the whole strip on Broadway is just honky tonk after honky tonk and you're getting cowboy boots and steel guitars and fiddles out your ears and uh, but if you're wanting kind of a more local experience mm. where old school um uh, people go to play like when artists go to play on their nights off and no one knows they're there kind of legendary artists will kind of pop on stage it's this tiny little place in the middle of nowhere on long hollow pike i believe it, it is in um goodlitzville and we used to go there pretty much every week when we lived there as locals. And um, it's basically, it looks like an RSA. It's this, <laughs> this building, half of it is like a, a cafeteria vibe, like long tables with chairs at them and, and amazing food again. And then the other half is a dance floor with a tiny, tiny little stage. And you get every, that's where the locals go. Mm -hmm. um, so you get people two-stepping, you get people line dancing, you get all the real beautiful country, um, country music. I remember the first time that we went, um, we were sitting in the audience watching and they, you could get up and do a song. And so we all got up, our family got up and did a song. And then my brother was unplugging his bass and the next band came up and he kind of got trapped because it's this tiny stage and it has kind of like a fence in front mm -hmm. of it. And he was trapped behind Bill Monroe, like the king of bluegrass <laughs> music <laughs> and uh, kind of had to sit there on stage with Bill Monroe and his band. Um, and it, it, those kind of magical things happen when you go to Nashville. Mm, yeah. That sounds amazing. Oh, and sorry, it's called the Long Hollow Jamboree. Okay. I didn't say what it was called. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I could yeah. I could ask you so many more questions, but we kind of <laughs> need to wrap up. But Juliet, do you have one last question for Tammy? Oh, I just think I can't even describe a word to sum all of that out, but it feels like Nashville's kind of like a big cliche of everything you imagine it, it totally to be. It totally is. It's everything you want it to be. And it, yeah. And it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you for your inside information. That's so helpful for anyone planning a trip there. And I'm sure there'll be so many people who are now planning a trip there because you've described Take it so the beautifully. Pants. Yeah, stretch your hands, <laughs> pack those. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and so your new album, Chicka Boom, can you just tell us a little bit quickly about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, that uh, Chicka Boom is, is out this February 2020. And um, it's, uh, I kind of wanted to strip back the music back to kind of those real rockabilly country roots. So um, the, the kind of in the tradition of the trios, Johnny Cash and Wanda Jackson and where it was kind of bass and drums and a guitar and that's it. And, and so I wanted the songs to be just punchy little firecrackers. So that's kind of the theme for this album. Great, can't wait to hear it. Well, Sounds yeah, thank fantastic. you again. And Juliet, thank you. Thank you. Um, and if you are listening to uh, Trip Notes, we would love you to rate, review and subscribe because it really helps other people to find us. And if you are listening, you should also go to nzherald.co.nz slash Trip Notes to watch the video because um, Tammy's outfit is just incredible. <laughs> so beautifully presented. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so you need, to, you need to have a look at that. So, uh, <laughs> And we'll be back for another episode in a fortnight. So um, we'll catch you then.